G'day. Welcome to Nevada. How you going everyone? Today I wanted to address something that has come up over the nomenclature of the virus SARS-CoV-2 which causes the disease COVID-19. But before I start I'm going to ask you to do some things for me. First of all please leave your current thoughts on the topic at the door. This is a touchy subject but I hope that even if you don't change your mind at least you'll have a better understanding. Secondly, please be kind in the comments section. I will delete harmful comments or comments that completely disregard or misrepresent the information I present here. Normally I wouldn't, but this is likely going to be one of those videos. Last but not least, please like, share and subscribe if you enjoy content like this. I've also added a list of videos below where I talk about controversial things, but advocate for more understanding like I do in this video. First of all, what is nomenclature? Well, there's lots of dictionary definitions, but the one I'm going to use today is from the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition 3a. A system or set of terms or symbols, especially in a particular science, discipline or art. Basically, these are the rules that surround the naming of something. Nomenclature is important in science because it streamlines and standardizes names. For example, in chemistry, IUPAC, which is basically an organization which tells people how to chemistry. It is a set of rules to name a molecule. This is based on the structure of the molecule. So if an organic chemist looks at a word such as this, they can draw the molecule that looks like this. Praise be to his noodliness. If organic chemists could name things whatever they wanted, communication breakdowns would be inevitable. Chemists would then mix things with things they shouldn't and suddenly the earth gets annihilated in a catastrophic chemical reaction. This is why we need rules in science people, jeez. But it doesn't just stop the world from being destroyed in freak accidents. Nomenclature often gives scientists important information around the type of thing they're looking at. For example, the virus SARS-CoV-2 was named because the virus is genetically related to the coronavirus responsible for the SARS outbreak of 2003. A virologist would look at that name and go, huh, it causes severe acute respiratory syndrome, is a coronavirus and is related to the disease that caused SARS but is not the same virus. The same thing applies for naming stars, asteroids, species, diseases, whatever. If there is a set of rules surrounding the name of something in science, you can learn a lot about what it is. That is why buying a kit to name a star is quite literally a waste of money. These stars will not change their name in any astronomy database except for the one you spent your money on. Yep, it's, it's a rod. If you want to do something similar, there is a website I'll link below where you get to adopt a star. For a small fee, you can adopt a star which goes directly towards research. And the person you get this for can pass down this gift for literally millions of years. I thought that was pretty cool. I adopted one with a suspected planet for a family member for $25. Okay, now that I think I've been talking for long enough to make sure my next sentence will trigger the algorithm, I want to explain why calling COVID-19 the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus or any other iteration outside of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 is extremely racist. I got this information from a wonderful science and skeptical thinking podcast called Skeptics with a K. I strongly recommend listening to the whole thing as I'm just giving you the footnotes. The podcast will give you a lot more historical context. The timestamps and the link to the episode is below. Please go listen to it. It is so much better than what I could ever explain to you. First of all, just in case somebody goes, nobody has been calling it the Chinese virus, please. Let me know where that wonderful, blissful place you are living in is. There are multiple examples of world leaders like Trump and prominent news outlets that use this term. This is despite what the World Health Organization has recommended. Because yeah, what would experts know? And before you also say, oh, well, what about Ebola or Zika or the Spanish flu? What about them? Huh? It wasn't racist back then, you bleeding liberal snowflake. Ha <laughs> ha! Well, let's be clear, citing a previously named disease as a reason for it being not racist does not in any way change the fact that today it is considered to be a driving force of racism and prejudice. 50 years ago, it was considered to be totally okay to beat your child if they misbehaved. After multiple studies, it has been shown that physical discipline is extremely damaging to children. There are no positives and corporal punishment is no longer recommended or even tolerated. We learn, we grow. This is an example of the science coming in and looking at the harm that previous conventions have caused and 
developing new policies in response to this. Because it's such a darling to folks who insist on using Chinese or Wuhan virus as a name, let's have a look at the Spanish flu. While it is still referred to by its original name by some epidemiologists, historians, etc., the preferred name is the 1918 H1N1 influenza pandemic, the 1918 pandemic, or a variant thereof. Some sources say this disease killed between 50 to 100 million people and infected about a third of the population at that time. The history of the 1918 pandemic is that it didn't actually start in Spain. It was thought to have started in army barracks or a military hospital base where there were lots of people in cramped, unsanitary conditions. Some experts believe it first appeared in Kansas where an outbreak of a similar disease was reported six months before the first diagnoses happened in Spain. Other people think it started in China and spread to American forces which then spread it around Europe via the movement of army personnel. There was a war going on. To stop morale from plummeting, the Allied and German forces prohibited reporting on the outbreak because it would undermine the war effort. Because Spain was neutral, the press had no pressure to not report on a disease that was killing a lot of people. So, superficially, it seemed like the disease started in Spain, but it didn't. There's one example of why it shouldn't be named after a place, because information that comes out after the initial reporting may end up being inaccurate. But why the sudden change? Why is it suddenly the 1918 H1N1 influenza pandemic? Well, in 2015, the World Health Organization changed its policy. They did this for a very good reason. Wait, what is the World Health Organization and why are we looking to it as the gold standard for worldwide policies and health? It is a specialized agency of the United Nations that oversees international public health. A specialized agency means that it's an independent international body that works alongside the UN. Its mission is to promote health, keep the world safe, and serve the vulnerable with measurable impact for people at country level. It has 194 member states, including all of the members of the UN except for Liechtenstein, but has the Cook Islands and Niu as member states. And I am sorry if I butchered that name. It employs 7,000 people in 149 different areas and is funded by private donors, such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as other countries. The US was one of the biggest donors to the WHO, amounting to just over 15% of financial support. I say was because Donald Trump decided to halt the US's funding to the organization on the 15th of April 2020 and terminated the relationship on the 30th of May. He cited the World Health Organization's response to COVID-19 and China's influence in the organization as the reason why. While there there are some concerning movements within the WHO and their push for traditional Chinese medicine to be accepted as legitimate medical practices, the WHO is still highly respected worldwide. Links to multiple stories on how Chinese medicine can cause horrendous ecological and economic harm in the description below. Let's not mention that entire species are being wiped out because of Chinese medicine. Unfortunately, look up pangolins if you don't believe me. Despite this, the WHO is a very influential organization in regards to making worldwide health policies and is often the point of reference for doctors, researchers, and lawmakers for policy guidance. The fact that the US has removed a sixth of its annual budget during the biggest pandemic we have seen on recent memory, that is more than a little bit worrying. By the way, Trump has not announced where he will be sending that money that he pulled from the WHO. His officials have said it will be going to other aid groups, such as the Red Cross, but I couldn't find any media reports which has confirmed that this has happened. As you can see, the WHO has made a lot of policies in regards to worldwide health. So why did they decide to change the policies around disease nomenclature? To be perfectly frank, it's to stop unnecessary damage. In a document I've linked below, it says, and I quote, The World Health Organization, in consultation and collaboration with the World Organization for Animal Health and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, has identified best practices for the naming of new human diseases with the aim to minimize unnecessary negative impacts of disease names on trade, travel, tourism, or animal welfare, and avoid causing offense to any cultural, social, national, regional, professional, or ethnic groups. The guidelines say that in the naming of a disease, it should be one, generic descriptive terms such as respiratory disease, hepatitis, neurologic syndrome, watery diarrhea, enteritis, etc. This is because when more information becomes available, these basic terms are unlikely to change. For example, whooping cough causes a distinctive crouping cough. Even if this disease is discovered to attack something unrelated to the lung, the main symptom of this disease will still be a cough. SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes the disease COVID-19, 
causes the person to have severe acute respiratory syndrome, which is what SARS stands for. However, we are finding that it also causes other problems such as blood clotting and kidney damage. But even still, that doesn't change the fact that it causes SARS. Number two, specific descriptive terms should be used whenever the available information is considered sufficiently robust that the vast changes to the epidemiology or clinical picture are unlikely to occur. Plain terms are preferred to highly technical terms, e.g. progressive, juvenile, severe, winter. This is not always the case, such as in diabetes. This is one of the reasons why they've changed the term of diabetes from juvenile and adult onset diabetes to type 1 and type 2. Type 1 diabetes is due to an autoimmune disorder that attacks the insulin producing cells in the pancreas, whereas type 2 is the formation of insulin resistance or the loss of insulin production, which is often caused by environmental factors such as weight, diet and age. Due to the increase of people under the age of 40 getting adult onset diabetes, they have had to change the names to type 1 and type 2 diabetes. However, if a disease continues to get worse over time, such as progressive supranuclear palsy, the word progressive is used because it's not going to change anytime soon because it is a symptom of the disease. Number three, if the causative pathogen is known, it should be used as part of the disease name with additional descriptors. The pathogen should not be directly equated with the disease as a pathogen may cause more than one type of disease. For example, novel coronavirus respiratory syndrome. Remember, this was written in 2015, well before SARS-CoV-2 was discovered. Number four, names should be short, minimum number of characters, and easy to pronounce, e.g. H7N9, rabies, malaria, polio. That one's pretty much self-explanatory. Number five, given that long names are likely to be shortened into an acronym, potential acronyms should be evaluated to ensure they also comply with these best practices. For example, you can't name a new disease something like coronavirus necrophizing testolitis as much as you might want to. And finally, the last guideline, number six. Names should be consistent as possible with guidance from the International Classification of Disease Content Model Reference Guide, which is cited in the article. They give examples in the article, but I would like you to look at table B or the naughty words. I'm going to skip around this table because some reasons are easier to explain than others. Remember, these are the new guidelines put out by the WHO to limit unnecessary harm. Terms that incite undue fear. You can't name a new disease, we're all going to die, or brain devouring amoebic infection. Imagine if COVID-19 was called drowning in your lung disease. I mean, there's enough panic as there is. The next type of words that go against guidelines are cultural, population, industry, or occupational references. For example, people who live near a coal mine can't get miners long. This can lead to misdiagnosis or a delay in diagnosis because there are people who have this disease that haven't worked a day in this mine. A person can dismiss their symptoms of miners' lungs as something as asthma because of that false sense of security, making them lose valuable time. Another category to name a disease after is people's names. For example, Asperger's syndrome. It actually turns out that Hans Asperger's was an absolute cockwomble. He actually used to work with the, oh screw it, this video isn't gonna get monetized anyway, Nazis. He experimented on children and then sent them to Spiegelgrund Clinic, which participated in the euthanasia program. The last two points are kind of interrelated when it comes to harm, so I'm going to address them at the same time. They are animals and geographic locations. I just want to make an acknowledgement here. I understand that prejudice against a group of people because of where they come from is xenophobia, while prejudice against a group of people because of their race is racism. However, in my opinion, xenophobia and racism are terms that are functionally the same thing. A person of Japanese descent will still get racism from people because they're Japanese, even if they were born in England. If I say a person is African, most people will think of a person with dark skin. If I said someone is from Africa, most people would think of somebody who had dark skin. You can't name a geographical place and expect people to not associate it with a stereotypical inhabitant of that country. Historically, linking an animal or geographical location to a disease has caused untold suffering. This includes the discrimination and prejudice against people in an outgroup. For example, the Black Death was personified by an elderly woman dressed in black holding a broom and a rake in Northern European folklore. While, of course, elderly women are not a different species of animal, nor are they from a particular geographic location, the Northern Europeans still link the Black Death 
back to elderly woman. Trust me, this tangent will make sense eventually. The idea of the broom and the rake is that if you get attacked by a woman with the rake, you might pass through the tongs and survive, but if you got attacked by her when she was using the broom, you're gonna die. That is how they explain the nature of that disease. But of course, this led to elderly women being attacked and killed by people because they thought that they were the literal personification of the Black Death. People were scared and paranoid and they had no idea what caused this disease. Remember, germ theory was first proposed centuries after the Black Death. They didn't know what microbes were. There were even some conspiracy theories that said certain groups of people were going around maliciously and deliberately spreading the plague. Because anti-Semitism is a thing, Jewish folks were among those accused of doing this. They were targeted by mobs who thought they were spreading the plague. It got so bad that Pope Clement VI made a declaration just asking people to stop attacking the Jews. That, of course, did not help. Mobs continued to kill Jewish people because they were associated with the plague, because they were associated with the disease. In June of 1916 in New York and other major centres along the east coast of America, there was an outbreak of polio. A rumour had been started that it had been brought in by Italian immigrants. Even now it is unknown why this outbreak occurred, but it was very unlikely it came from Italian immigrants. The reason why we know that is there was no outbreak in Italy at the time and there was no outbreak on Ellis Island. Ellis Island was the federal immigration depot where all immigrants were processed. Medical screening was part of the process and there was no recorded cases on Ellis Island. However, who lets facts come in the way of a good story? New Yorkers not only blamed the Italian immigrants, but also crazily established Italian communities. Surprise, surprise, they were vilified, discriminated against and attacked. They couldn't even get health care because even the nurses thought they were responsible for the outbreak. Not only that, but a rumour started that cats spread polio. Of course, we now know that polio is spread through contaminated stool, saliva and water. However, 72,000 cats were killed in New York in 1916 because they were associated with a disease. I hope you're starting to see a bit of a pattern here. In 2009, you might remember the swine flu pandemic, which led to a backlash against pigs. In fact, this is one of the reasons why the World Health Organization's guidelines require you to consider trade and animal welfare when naming diseases. In response to swine flu, several countries banned the import of pork, even though it isn't spread through meat. This caused a lot of economic harm to pork producers worldwide. The reason why it was named swine flu was because it was a mutated form of the disease that jumped from a pig to a human and then spread from human to human. The Egyptian government ordered the culling of all of the pigs in the country. Over 300,000 pigs were killed despite the lack of evidence that pigs were infected or if there was an, even an outbreak of swine flu in the country. I suppose you're asking why a Muslim majority country had 300,000 pigs. Well, Egypt also has a lot of Coptic Christian communities. So you can imagine when the government officials arrived to slaughter their pigs on which they relied on food, that led to accusations of religious persecution and may have been a convenient excuse for said religious persecution. Let's go back to the 1980s. When HIV AIDS was first identified, it was first called GRID or Gay Related Immune Deficiency and was colloquially called the Gay Plague. So of course, not that they need it anymore, but more stigma and prejudice against the gay community ensued. I will give kudos though, it was never called that in medical literature. There were rumours that HIV was spread by fomites or non-living disease vectors such as doorknobs and toilet seats, and of course, that gay men were maliciously spreading the disease. People who contracted it in utero because their mother was HIV positive or from infected blood transfusions were also discriminated against. Ryan White, for example, got HIV due to an infected blood transfusion. When he was diagnosed, parents and teachers tried to stop him from coming to school, despite the fact that there was next to no chance of spreading the disease. He was also very heavily bullied by his classmates. He later became a celebrity, an AIDS educator and advocate and died six and a half years after his diagnosis. The Ryan White Care Act was passed in 1990 in his honour and funds low income households that are affected by HIV. Unfortunately, AIDS discrimination continues even now. I found an article from 2012 where a 14 year old boy and his mother got a $700,000 payout because the school he tried to enrol in rejected his application on the grounds that he had HIV. 
One could ask if that would have happened if it wasn't for the fact it was associated with gay people when it was first discovered. I can't talk about HIV without talking about the Reagan administration's response to the outbreak. Health officials first became aware of HIV in the summer of 1981. In autumn of 1982, the CDC described AIDS for the first time. Unfortunately, by that time, AIDS was associated with gay men, which meant reporting on it was controversial and often the media shied away from it. That in itself probably killed a lot of people due to a lack of awareness in the general community. Meanwhile, it was decimating the GRSM community. It wasn't just a fear of a deadly and unknown illness killing people they loved, but there was a fear of contracting it and having to tell friends and family that they were gay. That could lead to social and, in some places, legal consequences. By January 1983, experts were very aware of the danger posed by this disease and knew it required immediate public health action. However, the government was still silent on the issue and refused to give the disease adequate funding. From History.com, I found this very concerning tidbit. To make it through congressional opponents, the first federal funding for AIDS research had to be coupled with toxic shock syndrome and Legionnaire's disease in a public health emergency trust fund. And following his agenda of trimming the federal government, President Reagan cut budgets to the CDC and National Institutes of Health. The article then goes on to say, The inadequate funding to date has seriously restricted our work and presumably deepened the invasion of this disease into the American population. A CDC staffer wrote in an April 12, 1983 memo to Dr. Walter Dowdle, assistant director of the CDC at the time. In addition, the time wasted pursuing money from Washington has cast an air of despair over AIDS workers throughout the country. In early 1985, the CDC developed the nation's first AIDS prevention plan, which was rejected. In September 1985, Four years after it was first identified in the US, Ronald Reagan first publicly mentioned AIDS. Four years after. On October the 2nd that year, Congress allocated $190 million for AIDS research, 70 million more than they were expecting. Also, I've linked a seven minute video in the description below, which just shows a little bit of how hostile the Reagan administration was towards HIV or AIDS. It's audio between a reporter, Lester Kingsolving, and the Reagan press secretary, Larry speaks. In it was laughter, mocking, and homophobia throughout the press conferences. Watch it. It will make you angry. And so it should. Now the next question is, if that disease infected white, upper-class suburban men, do you really think it would have taken that long? HIV AIDS is another perfect example of how associating a disease with an outgroup can and will kill people. Let's talk about something a little more recent. COVID-19. Human Rights Watch has an article talking about how there's been a major spike in attacks against people of Asian descent since COVID-19 came out. In the article, linked below, it mentions on May the 8th, 2020, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that the pandemic continues to unleash a tsunami of hate and xenophobia, scapegoating and scaremongering, and urged governments to act now to strengthen the immunity of our societies against the virus of hate. In April this year, an Australian Chinese family living in Victoria had their house vandalised two nights in a row. On the first night, they had COVID-19 China's die spray painted on their garage door. And the next night, they had a rock thrown through their window. In Geelong, Victoria, at roughly the same time, a doctor was waiting in line at a restaurant and he was verbally abused by a woman saying, he shouldn't be hanging around and that he should be at home. On March the 17th in Southampton, England, a group of Chinese students who were wearing masks were attacked by a group of people who threw rocks at them and were told to go back to their fucking country and that they were a virus. A report by SBS Australia stated that the month of February has the highest number of complaints under the Racial Discrimination Act in this financial year, and 32% of these complaints are COVID-19 related. You really don't have to dig very far to find examples of racist attacks against Asian people surrounded COVID-19. So if this is happening with the use of the word coronavirus, imagine how much worse it would be if it was called the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus, or Kung Flu, or whatever. Insisting on these names only serves to perpetuate the association of people of Asian descent with that disease, and therefore reinforces those racist attitudes. That's obviously not to say that not referring to COVID-19 inappropriately is going to stop people from associating coronavirus and Asians, because clearly it hasn't. Patient zero was in China, and this fact is highly publicised. However, the reports are coming out that people are saying you have COVID-19, not 
you have the Chinese virus. The association is still there. But if we look at human history, especially at times of disease, people are very quick to scapegoat outgroups without any regard to their role in the spread of the disease. The World Health Organization recognizes the problem and has taken steps to minimize the role the scientific community plays in causing harm. This is why they've decided to not name new diseases after geographical locations, animals, or occupations moving forward. Just think of what would have happened if the Black Death was known as the Jewish Plague. Think of how much worse it would have been for the Jewish community. And if you think about it, centuries later, that association would still be there. In 100 years time, the association of China with COVID-19 will no longer be there, other than the fact that it was the origin of the disease. That is why when SARS-CoV-2 was initially discovered, the scientific community put a placeholder name while they were still trying to figure out what to formally call it. That name was 2019 NCOV. The reason why they did that was because they didn't want people to start calling it the Wuhan flu or something along those lines. If they didn't make an official name immediately, people were going to make one up and names stick. Adhering to the new guidelines, the scientists called the virus SARS-CoV-2 and the disease it caused COVID-19, or Coronavirus Infectious Disease 2019. So when you see Donald Trump crossing out COVID-19 to write Chinese virus, this isn't him dying on a hill regarding pre-2015 disease nomenclature. It is him deliberately removing the neutral terminology and replacing it with the name of an outgroup he is hoping to blame for the disease. Remember, Trump withdrew 15% of the World Health Organization's funding because he said it was controlled too much by China. And also as one of his first policy, he also started a trade war with them, aiming to hurt the Chinese economy. Him refusing to call it by its official name is his way to scapegoat and outgroup as the cause of the mounting death toll. If you're telling me that's not racist, then I really question what you think racism is. But Navadia, what about the people calling it the Trump virus? Isn't that racist? Well, no. Trump isn't a group of people, nor is he a protected class. Personally, I don't like the use of the term myself. However, it is using a term that points the finger directly at the reason why America's disease and death toll is skyrocketing, why the economy is crashing, why the healthcare system is collapsing, and why there is so much civil unrest in his country. It's reminding everyone why America is so far up shit creek without a paddle. It wasn't the Chinese that caused America's problem. It was a lack of leadership, especially by its president. If he had just listened to the expert at the beginning of the year and actually led the country, the American public wouldn't be in the horrendous situation it is right now. In America, it is far more accurate to associate his name with COVID-19 than China. It is one thing to be angry about here, which is the Chinese government's handling of the virus. Reports came out a while ago that they put the first doctor that found it to shame and he died of the virus while they tried to suppress info about it from getting out. But that's the Chinese government, not the Chinese people. Anyway, thank you for joining me. Please wash your hands, please wear a mask, and please stay safe. Also, please check out all of my sources linked below. And also, again, please listen to the podcast Skeptics with a K, which is where I got all of this information from. And don't forget, scandium, iodine, nitrogen, and cerium. I just want to say a very special thank you to my wonderful patrons, especially my $10 breadback spider patrons, Aided Furball, Lauren Hart, Mary Sividano, Amanda Vogue, Ross Devereux, and Atheist Pastor. I also want to say a very special thank you to my $20 platypus patrons, Paul Butler and Ethan Stroop. I hope this has given you more information as to why it is now considered racist to call COVID-19 any variant outside of its official name. And also please don't be afraid to share this with people that you know call with this. 